many of you, what you've just listened to may have sounded familiar, but not exactly right. Perhaps you felt that something was altered or missing. What I just played was the Sarabande from Bach's first partita in B flat major, but in my own unornamented version. What this means is that I consider the published version of the Sarabande to be an example of Bach writing out all the ornamentation, and what I did was try and imagine what an original, unornamented version could sound like. Before we proceed, a couple of disclaimers. First, I'm certainly not the first to present an unornamented version of a Bach piece. Secondly, I am not claiming my version actually reflects how Bach started out writing this Sarabande. This is simply an imaginary reconstruction. The reason I find it very beneficial to make such a reconstruction is because it can help us to better understand Bach's final version and thus to arrive at a more convincing interpretation. Bach's tendency to write out ornamentation or embellishments is something we can establish in various ways. Incidentally, I also addressed this issue in a previous video where I examined the Sarabande from the sixth partita in E minor, which is even more heavily ornamented than the one in the first partita. And I will include a link to that video in the video description. One way to confirm Bach has already ornamented this Sarabande would be to compare it to other Sarabandes written by his contemporaries. Even more revealing is to compare it to other Sarabandes by Bach himself, and especially those of the second and third English suites, for which Bach provided both a plain and an ornamented version. For instance, let's look at the Sarabande of the third English suite in G minor. Here is the first section of the plain version. And here are the same measures in the ornamented version. If we now look at the first section of the Sarabande of the first partita, we can see that it resembles the ornamented version of the Sarabande from the third English suite. Yet another clue of Bach's tendency to ornament, or perhaps even over-ornament his music, comes from the contemporary German theorist and composer Johann Adolf Scheibe, who, writing in 1737, criticized Bach, whom he otherwise considered one of the finest composers, precisely for the tendency to write out all the ornaments in his music. Quote, This great man would be the wonder of all nations if he had a more pleasing style, and if he did not spoil his compositions by bombast and intricacies, and by excess of art hide their beauty. All ornaments, all small grace notes, and everything which by rule musicians understand how to play, he writes out in full, and thus not only are his pieces deprived of the beauty of harmony, but it is totally impossible to distinguish the melody." End quote. Understanding that what we have is not just a sarabande, but an ornamented sarabande can affect our performance in very crucial ways. The first has to do with the choice of tempo. Now, you may have heard the claim that Bach did not provide many performance indications in his scores, and that many of his scores don't contain tempo indications. Without getting into too much detail, let me say that, first of all, the idea that Bach did not provide many performance indications has to do more with the fact that many performers, 
tend to read Baroque scores just like they read 19th and 20th century scores. And the problem with that approach is that Baroque scores have a different way of conveying information to us. In other words, Bach's music, just like Baroque music in general, contains plenty of performing and expressive indications, provided one understands how to read the score. And in the case of tempo, while I would never claim there is such a thing as one correct tempo, nevertheless, there is usually more information than many performers think. So when Bach calls this piece a sarabande, this immediately provides important information both about its character and an approximate tempo. And there is a variety of historical sources that can help us in figuring out what this approximate tempo might be. It's also important to keep in mind that when trying to establish a tempo, we need to consider the unit of the beat, which here is the quarter note. So I'm basically looking at the left hand in order to establish a tempo. And here is where having an unornamented version can be helpful because it allows us to not get bogged down by the proliferation of notes in the right hand. As I mentioned before, there is no single correct tempo for this piece. However, I have heard many performances, and especially performances on a modern piano, where the tempo seems to have been decided by a literal interpretation of the right hand as a melody rather than an ornamented melody. And usually this approach results in performances that are too slow because the character of the sarabande is lost. And just like when we choose a tempo for the sarabande of the third English suite, we do so based on the unornamented version, making our own unornamented version of this sarabande helps us decide on an appropriate tempo. Let me show you what I mean. If we forget for a moment Bach's final ornamented version and instead concentrate on my unornamented version, I would say that this is probably a satisfactory tempo. But playing Bach's version at that tempo makes it faster than most recorded performances and, in some cases, significantly so. <laughs> 
Therefore, imagining an unornamented version forces us to reevaluate the tempo of the piece. Having an unornamented version also encourages us to reevaluate the way we play all the notes that were left out. In other words, those that are usually notated with faster note values. Since these notes are ornamental and their function is to embellish the primary musical line, it is better to perform them as ornaments rather than interpret them literally. Let me show you what I mean. A literal interpretation could be something like this. etc. etc. What I did there was to interpret the note values literally and you probably noticed how different this was than the version that I played before. I have also heard several performances on the piano where all of these fast note values are interpreted in a very emphatic way as if they were part of a long melody. And usually those performances are also the ones that are a little slower. Let me see if I can demonstrate what I mean. etc. etc. The trouble with this approach, as you probably heard, is that it doesn't work very convincingly on the harpsichord, and so clearly this is not what Bach would have had in mind. Indeed, the musical language of Baroque music is not made up of extended long phrases, but rather short expressive gestures. And while choosing to play Bach's music on the modern piano is a valid personal choice, understanding the capabilities of the instrument Bach had in mind, as well as the musical language he used, can make a performance on a modern instrument more convincing and engaging. Otherwise, all those wonderful expressive gestures are overlooked and the performance becomes one-dimensional. Let me show you a couple of examples of this, although again, you probably noticed the difference between the very last performance and the very first performance. But it's the difference between, um, let's say, if I just play the, the right hand for a moment. I would do it this way. I exaggerated the spaces a little bit, but I hope you can see the difference here that I'm beginning to think of these, um, these ornamented passages as short expressive gestures, not just one entire thing. And there are other spots where I would say this is even more prominent. <laughs> 
For example, if I look at what is measure 5, this passage here. So I played it kind of literally right now and trying to connect everything. What happens when you do this is that you're basically ignoring all the expressive gestures that are in this passage and you're making everything into one long melody and this is what I mean by something sounding one-dimensional instead of doing for instance something like this So you have all of these wonderful little um, and then this one here, Bach actually instructs you to hold down the notes. So we have a nice chord and then we go back. So in other words, what, what is really happening here is much richer in terms of expression compared to simply playing one long uninterrupted melody. Since the notes that were left out are meant to be ornamental, the first thing I would suggest doing is to not give them too much importance. The other thing to realize is that a written out ornament can never be more than an imperfect approximation of how an ornament should be performed. Try accurately writing down a Charlie Parker solo and you'll see what I mean. So a literal interpretation of the note values is not going to get us very far and you probably heard that in the previous demonstration. The way I like to think of it is that I have a certain time frame to play an ornamental passage. In other words, I look at the space a passage occupies within the measure and then I know I must fit the notes within that space without necessarily thinking of specific note values. Basically, I approach an ornamental passage just like I approach specific ornaments, like, for instance, trills. Trills are not measured, but rather occupy a particular time frame, and the notes of the trill have to fit within that time frame. So if we go back now to the opening measures, you could interpret them like this. etc. etc. Finally, I wanted to look at a particular feature that occurs throughout the piece, namely octaves or chords in the left hand on the second beat, followed by rest on the third beat. The reason for this feature is clear. Bach wants to emphasize the second beat, which is fairly typical for a sarabande, and since he's thinking in terms of the harpsichord's capabilities, he writes a thicker chord on the second beat and often places it at a lower register in order to get more of the harpsichord's resonance and thus create a dynamic effect. He effectively makes the second beat sound the loudest and the rest on the third beat further emphasizes this dynamic effect. For me, the tricky aspect was how to approach and play the rest on the third beat because lifting my hand too quickly 
created a very sudden and dramatic effect that seemed too exaggerated. In other words, something like this. Again, I exaggerated a little bit so you can see what I mean. Now, my solution was to try and lift my fingers as slowly as possible in most of these passages so that the effect is more gentle. etc. etc. In the performance you will hear, I will take advantage of the convention of repeating each section of a Baroque dance form in order to present both my unornamented version and Bach's published version side by side. So for each section, I will first play my version and for the repeats, I will play Bach's published version. A note about the score that accompanies the performance. The score you will see for the unornamented version is the rough draft I made and played from. I want to stress it is in rough draft form and so there are many details that don't necessarily conform to standard usage. For instance, the beaming of the notes. Please keep in mind that this score reflects how I was simplifying Bach's ornamented version as I was going along. So that partially explains some of the notational idiosyncrasies. They might make more sense if you imagine there are other details that are left out. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.